there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. Artificial intelligence, not just a new technology, it's a revolution. It will change every single major industry. I think AI is the new electricity. Artificial intelligence enables machines to speak like humans, to see like humans, to reason like humans. But will robots and artificial intelligence replace humans? A third of American jobs are at risk. There is going to be significant disruption. Anybody who's on a phone, the job's gone. New technology displaces some forms of labor. That's the whole point of it. Jobs have been killed off for centuries by machines. In the past, safety nets helped families in times of uncertainty and got children ready for the future. But what about now? These massive technological changes require big interventions. I think in the US we are at a crisis point with our social programs. If we compare the performance of American students with that of students in other countries, we do pretty badly. The days when you can get a four-year college degree and then expect to dine out on that for 30 years is long gone. We should be good in panic. Just how scared should we be? He's a robot. Without you, what could he do? There's no limit to what he could do. He could destroy the Earth. In this hour, we will examine the history of technology and the future of work. I'm historian Elizabeth Cobbs. Fables have long reflected our fears of technology. Icarus flew too close to the sun and was killed by his invention. Dr. Frankenstein was destroyed by the monster he created. Movies from Metropolis to the Matrix have played on these fears, riveting us in our seats, giving us nightmares, and selling tickets. Good morning, Dr. Cobbs. Meet your new assistant. The latest in robotics and artificial intelligence. Robots for the classroom. It's the future, Dr. Cobbs. Why do we fear the very things that bring progress? For centuries, governments held back invention. The Ottoman Empire banned the printing press. The Chinese emperor outlawed voyages of discovery. The pope imprisoned Galileo. Queen Elizabeth prohibited a weaving machine that would put knitters out of work. It's some kind of primal fear. Maybe it goes all the way back to the Stone Age. What if we'd never overcome these ancient fears? What was life like before technology? How about we rewind history? of how we live relative to our ancestors a couple hundred years ago who were scrapping out living on the farm, dying in their 30s and 40s, half of their children dying. Families seldom had enough to eat. Terrible plagues killed routinely. People were cold. They lived hand to mouth. A person who lived 2,000 years ago didn't live much differently than somebody that lived, say, 350 years ago. Because after the plow, there really wasn't a lot of innovation. Women and men rose before dawn to tend their animals and worked into the night, repairing tools and spinning thread. In colonial Boston, three out of 10 children died in the first year of life. The tolling of funeral bells was so frequent that towns regulated them as a public nuisance. So it was utterly miserable in 1800 and before. You were hungry. 
you were cold, you were uneducated. The life of humans was solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Before invention, there was little economic progress for thousands of years. Life expectancy was so poor that world population barely grew. Then, history split in two. Humans began inventing machines to supplement what they could do by hand. It was the start of the first industrial revolution, driven by steam. The first industrial revolution happened at the end of the 18th century, and that was steam engines, locomotives, railroads, and steamships. The railroad is the quintessential innovation of the Industrial Revolution, particularly those huge railroads that span the American continent. In time, there was a second Industrial Revolution, driven by electricity. Then the second Industrial Revolution, which I call the big one, happened starting around 1870. We had electricity, the internal combustion engine, and the first wireless communication. His invention of the light bulb has often been ranked with the invention of the wheel as the most beneficial to mankind. Think of the electric light. Think of subways. Think of elevators. Think of electric machines replacing old clumsy steam engines. Think of the um, household innovations, the washing machine, the dishwasher. A big week's wash, but it won't ache any woman's back. No bending over the scrub board while your arms and fingers ache the washing machine freed women to join the labor force. They say a lady in Missouri even taught her ringer how to shell peas. Then came computers. The third industrial revolution started around 1960 with the mainframe computer. More than two million digits can be recorded. Many computers, the personal computer. By the end of the 1980s, we already had the basic elements of what we consider the modern digital age. I asked for a car, I got a computer. What were the results of these three industrial revolutions? People left farming, went to school. They got jobs, earned wages. Their children survived. A middle class emerged. I live better than the richest person lived 100 years ago. Take, you know, I live better than J.P. Morgan. He didn't have an iPhone. He didn't have open heart surgery. He didn't have penicillin. You can't have people figuring out penicillin. They're trying to figure out how to put enough food on the table to keep them alive till tomorrow. We've literally gone from an 18-year life expectancy to, during the Cro-Magnon era to all the way to 80 today. The, the extension of average human life expectancy probably is humankind's greatest accomplishment. The car led the way to a frontier with wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. In just a few hundred years, industrialization transformed life on our planet. And charted a path to the stars. So why did invention suddenly take off? What caused history to split in two? The first industrial revolution sprang from a new idea around 1776 that empowered inventors. It was the idea that all people are created equal and thus have an equal right to profit from their own brain power. As Adam Smith said, the liberal plan of equality, liberty, and justice was amazingly productive in the economy and had, of course, the immediate effect of making people free. It's absolutely crucial to our understanding of the Industrial Revolution to see that it was in part a shift in values away from the aristocratic values of previous eras to the middle class values, the work ethic. Opportunity became open to all, especially in the US. The Declaration of Independence said all men had an unalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But the pursuit of happiness is not just kind of pleasure. It's not just the pursuit of ice cream. It's, it means the pursuit of economic and social success. The founders incorporated three principles into the Constitution to guarantee equality. Access to opportunity, transparency of information, and rule of law. 
They had both idealistic and practical motivations. The country was young, vulnerable, and poor. The country was heavily indebted, and it was not at all clear circa 1790 whether the experiment of the United States would actually succeed. And the founders understand that you either grow or you become a British colony again or a colony of somebody else. The first Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, knew that America could not simply farm its way to wealth. He wrote a plan to encourage manufacturing and invention. That transformation of the United States from colonial backwater to world leader happened because the U.S. was a highly innovative society with a highly innovative economy. And what drove that process was the ability of quite average people to invent something. The founders wrote invention right into the Constitution. The Constitution allowed anyone to patent their ideas. Everyone else could see their patent application. Courts protected an inventor's monopoly on sales for a small number of years. What makes America different from the rest of the world isn't the inherent inventiveness of the people. It's that if you invent and you take a risk, you have a high probability of being able to reap the fruits of your efforts. The Patent Office was the most democratic piece of the American government. The nation benefited from the brain power of people from all walks of life. Thomas Jennings, a free man of color, patented dry cleaning. He used the money to buy his family out of slavery. Mary Anderson patented the windshield wiper before women could vote. Common people could rise from poverty. One man born in a log cabin to illiterate parents became the first president to own a patent. The United States became a nation of inventors, and that pursuit of innovation and the patent that sanctifies it uh, became a very important part of, of American culture, to the point that it became a distinguishing feature of the United States. American inventors transformed the world. Benjamin Franklin dazzled Europeans with his experiments in electricity. He warmed fellow citizens with his Franklin stove. Robert Fulton designed Nautilus, the world's first submarine for Napoleon Bonaparte. He patented the world's first steamship on New York's Hudson River. Cyrus McCormick of Virginia patented a mechanical reaper in 1834. His threshers saved the backs of men worldwide. Isaac Singer of New York patented the sewing machine in 1851. His invention saved the eyesight of women. One day, a man in one part of the country will communicate by word of mouth with another in a distant place. Over the next century, Americans, many of them immigrants, patented more inventions than any other people. Patents literally made America. But there were winners and losers. Older businesses went out of business. Those workers lost their jobs. New technology displaces some forms of labor. That's the whole point of it. The new things are phenomenal for the users and for the people who used to make the old things, those businesses are often not gonna make it. Remember John Henry and the steam drill? So every steam drill destroyed certainly 10 jobs of people hammering spikes into railroads. The, the robot of the 19th century was the steam drill. So you have a whole progression of one occupation being decimated, but other occupations uh, taking their place. Machines like this destroy jobs. Think of the number of people who'd be working if we didn't have these power looms. Yes. I guess every woman in America would be weaving, and every home would be a sweatshop producing clothes for the family, like they were before we had power looms. I don't think I'd like that very much. Telephone operators, gone. Travel agents almost wiped out by airline and hotel websites. We're going on a vacation together, and we'd like you to help us. We like swimming and tennis and... Uh... 
We like to dance. I think I can fix you up at a place where you'll meet a few congenial young men. How would you like that? Oh, that, that sounds good. Well. You don't make horse and buggies like we used to. Um, and so those people went through disruption when there was change. You know, no one wanted a faster horse. <laughs> you know, you wanted a car. Economists call job turnover, driven by innovation, creative destruction. Creative destruction is what capitalism does. So an innovator comes along with a good idea, and they start a company, and very often they create an entirely new industry around it. That's easy. That's the creation part of it. New companies, new industries, new jobs are all part of that eureka process. However, that eureka process displaces what was there before. The old industries go away. They're just not needed anymore. That's the destruction part of it. Sometimes those displaced turn violent. Industrial revolution wasn't pretty. The resistance to industrial technology in 19th century Britain was often violent. Luddites, Ned Ludd was a mythical character, smashed up machinery. Disrupted workers often could not imagine what they do next. Like the tender of the livery stable when the horse was replaced by the automobile. At the turn of the century, people couldn't imagine motels and motor parks and drive-in movies and all the things that were made possible by the automobile. So our imaginations aren't capable of thinking up all the new jobs. Adjusting to the new economy is, is hard, and it always has been hard. I mean, that has been the price we've paid for the fact that you and I are not spending today hoeing a field of potatoes. Overall, life was better once people conquered their fears and governments protected invention. Countries that embraced new technology found that average income increased by 10,000% in 300 years. People were freed from constant disease and poverty. Life expectancy tripled. Hi, Dr. Cobbs. Oh, right, robot for the classroom. Okay, robot for the classroom, carry these tests. I am not programmed to carry things. Well, then what do you do? I can recognize faces like those of your students. Artificial intelligence has ignited a fourth industrial revolution. What is AI? Artificial intelligence is not really about intelligence. Artificial intelligence is simply the next wave of automation. Artificial intelligence is already in huge ways making our lives better. When you get on an airplane and fly from San Francisco to New York, 99% of commercial air miles at this point are flown by a machine, not by the person. AI gives us a clear shot at building self-driving cars that will transform transportation. I think we have a clear shot to transforming agriculture. I think AI will help doctors with diagnosis, with care of long-term health conditions. The best doctor probably can do 60, 65, 70% uh, um, mm, accurate guesses looking at, 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 at the screen. Machine now does probably 80, 85 to 90%. Scientists can grow new bladders and new blood vessels and parts of hearts and even parts of lungs. Artificial intelligence will allow researchers to pick up on patterns that they couldn't otherwise do. It will allow them to gather data and sort through the data much quicker than they would have been able to do with just their human brain. Combined with robotics, artificial intelligence will transform manufacturing just as tractors changed farming. One of the challenges of explaining the impact of AI is that it will change every single major industry. I think AI is the new electricity. Artificial intelligence uh, enables machines like robots to speak like humans, to see like humans, to play games like humans, to reason like humans, even to communicate like humans. Quiet, please. I'm doing the talking. I'm sorry. That's the most remarkable thing I've ever seen. Mathematician John McCarthy coined the term artificial intelligence in 1955. He predicted that computers could be programmed to mimic human thought. You are listening to the heartbeat of the sage computer. Every instrument in this room is constantly testing, pulse taking, controlling. For decades, scientists pursued McCarthy's idea in vain. Then, in 1997, 
artificial intelligence came back into the news when IBM's Deep Blue computer defeated world chess champion Garry Kasparov. In a stunning development, Garry Kasparov has resigned the position. Oh, what a shock! It was a painful defeat in 1997, uh, not just because I lost to a computer, it was the first match I lost, period. I don't recall any particular point where he made a mistake that lost, you know, a significant number of points. I think it's outstanding uh, scientific achievement. The strongest chess players, including the world champion today, they are much, much weaker than machines. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Watson. Since then, computers fueled by artificial intelligence have gotten better and better at beating our champions. I reached a certain conclusion after playing with machines, fighting machines, working with machines. Any process uh, uh, that we can quantify for the machines, the machine will do better. Three critical developments finally made artificial intelligence practical. First, processing power became faster and cheaper. In 1985, the most powerful computer was the Cray-2. It filled a room, cost $35 million, and was blind, deaf, and mute. Today, smartphones process data 10 times faster, cost under 1,000, and can see, hear, and speak. Data storage improved as well. In 1956, IBM's best hard drive weighed 2,000 pounds and leased for $3,000 per month. It had a storage capacity of five megabytes. Today, a thumb drive has 200 times more storage and costs less than $5. Then, digitization made vast amounts of information available. Books, sounds, pictures, and data from sensors were digitized. Today, 4.6 billion cell phones around the planet feed the growing pool of data. 90% of all the recorded data in human history has been collected and stored in the last two years. The internet distributes this data globally, instantly, and at zero cost. But it took more than fast computers and digitized data to make AI real. The third essential element was a new type of computer programming called deep learning. Hello, iCub. Hello. Who am I? You are Tony. And who are you? I am a robot, and I am developing a sense of self. Recently, a lot of the improvements in AI have been due to one type of technology called the deep learning, or called an artificial neural network. A traditional computer program cannot learn. It requires a detailed list of instructions. If the computer encounters something its human programmer did not put on the list, the computer crashes. Neural networks are different. Instead of following instructions, they write instructions. At the beginning, a human defines a goal and feeds huge amounts of data to the computer. The neural network then crunches that data to find the best way to achieve the goal. For instance, if you give the machine um, the picture of a bottle of water, the machine will look at it and will compare the pixels in the image with the pixels in many other images of bottles of water that humans have previously tagged and said these are bottles of water. The machine doesn't know what you do with it. Do you throw it? Do you eat it? Do you drink for it from it? It has no idea. Neural networks recognize patterns in complex data, but humans teach the computer what to look for. Think about it as if you had an all-powerful but somewhat dopey genie at your disposal, and you said, make me a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and he shows up and he just drops the bread and a jar of peanut butter and a jar of jelly and a knife in front of you. And then you say, no, 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 I want it as a sandwich. So they go, okay. And he gets out the piece of bread and he spreads some peanut butter on the bread, spreads some jam on the bread, and he puts them together with the peanut butter on the outside here and the jam on the outside here and slaps it down on the table. You're like, no, 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 the peanut butter and the jelly have to both go inside because I don't want to get my hands all dirty. That's how a good sandwich is. Okay. That's how the jobs of the future are gonna feel to most people we're going to have computers that can do things we can't do, but we're gonna spend our time, instead of doing the job, the jobs are gonna to be too hard for us to do in many respects, actually trying to carefully specify what exactly we want them to do, because they don't care what we mean by a sandwich. Artificial intelligence also makes robots smarter. Cameras and sensors have expanded the jobs robots can perform, 
and construction materials are stronger and lighter than ever. Robotics puts computation in motion. Imagine a future where people would connect with machines in much more intuitive ways, where machines would be able to understand what people want. In that future, everyone will be able to use robots, just like everyone uses smartphones. But is this vision of AI too rosy? Does AI have the potential to take over? <laughs> Movies portray robots as thinking creatures bent on destruction. Warnings abound in the media. We just don't know what's going to happen um, once uh, there's intelligence substantially greater than that of a human brain. What do we do? Full artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. Some speculate about a point of no return called singularity. Singularity is a point in time after which artificial intelligence has progressed so much that it's impossible to predict what's going to happen next. It's sort of this black box that we can't touch because we don't know what's coming. I'm not afraid of the singularity. I'm not afraid of it because I think that humans will be at the center of it. You're not a bad dancer. The public impression is that these machines are going to come, marry our women, and drink our wine. There is zero technical support for the idea that machines are going to become sentient creatures with their own independent goals and desires. Part of the mystique of AI is its ability to learn from data, figure out new things by itself. But at the end, it is just a piece of software. Just because we're so good at building specialized intelligences, it does not mean that these evil sentient killer robots are anywhere on the horizon. But that message does not sell movie tickets. You had your time. The future is our world. Catch! Get ready for a surprise! Why would they want to take over humanity? I have a different fear for us to have. What if computers become hyper-intelligent and want not to do our work for us anymore? They want to be like our dogs and cats and just lie on the couch all day. If you could run the world or just lie on the couch all day and have somebody else take care of you, which would you take? Humans and machines are different. Humans seek new experiences. Machines don't. They have no imagination or intuition, and no one knows if they ever will. People are very different. We learn from an example of one. We don't need to look at a million examples of what a bottle is in order to know what a bottle is and what to do with it. One of AI's advantages is its reliance on data instead of intuition. Some companies now use performance data to decide raises rather than personal recommendations. AI can reduce bias, but if the data is flawed, AI can magnify errors. They do not have common sense reasoning. Uh, they require a lot of training, a lot, a lot of data that is manually labeled by people. And even with that data, sometimes they make mistakes. You can have the smartest and most reliable witness in the world, but if that witness were trained using completely faulty information and never was allowed to understand the variation between what that information was saying and how the real world works, you're going to get a biased opinion. So just as it's true that a very smart expert might give you garbage in, garbage out, all these technologies will give you garbage in, garbage out, potentially. The negative side of all these neural networks having an impact is they can be stupid. They're, they're not by default smart, right? It's like a little kid, right? Don't do that again. Don't do that again. And so having people try to define and manage and weight all those things, that'll be a necessity. History shows that all technologies have risks. Electricity was frightening at first. Thomas Edison electrocuted an elephant to show that while electricity could kill, it could also be made safe enough for a child. Once we learned to manage the risks, electricity brightened our world. If you think of robots as artificial people that are coming to compete with us and take our jobs, that's not a helpful perspective. If you think of robots as the next phase of automation, just as the automobile was, or the railroads were, then you get a very different perspective about what its potential benefits are. AI and robots are tools. 
that we invent, we create, they're tools by the people and for the people. Cranes lift heavier objects than we can. Calculators are faster at math. Dogs detect smells better. Nobody worries about the fact that an automobile can run faster than a human being, or that an ATM can count money more accurately than teller. We see those as advantages. We don't build machines to compete with people. We do not build machines to make our lives worse. We build machines to improve our lives. AI is a tool that allows us to make decisions based upon extensive data instead of gut instinct, from driving across town to investing for retirement to undergoing surgery. There's about 60 years worth of really solid research comparing human decision makers versus algorithms on exactly these kinds of important decisions. The results of that body of research are incredibly clear. For heaven's sake, take the algorithm. As computers, which are levers for our minds, and robots, which are levers for our bodies, make it possible for us to move larger boulders, as Archimedes would say. AI and robots will perform all kinds of tasks we would rather not do ourselves, or that make us more efficient. All done. Now you have all my students' names and photographs. Show me Jose Lopez. Lopez. Jose. Current grade average, B+. Plus. He has missed two classes this semester. <laughs> That's right. OK, so here's Jose's test. Can you grade it? I do not have that capability. Can you learn how to do it? My functions are limited, Dr. Cobbs. Robots and AI cannot do everything. A program that flies a plane cannot read x-rays. But there is a lot they can do, and they're putting people out of work. Leaders are worried. 90% of the jobs that will be had by our young children or grandchildren simply don't exist today. Something like 60% of occupations have about a third of their activities that can be automated. We estimate that two-thirds of all jobs that currently exist in developing countries will be wiped out by automation. New technology has always done this. At the turn of the century, 70% of Americans worked on farms. Now 3% of Americans work on farms. 57% of the jobs that were done in the 1960s don't exist today. We don't have telephone operators, of which there were millions. We don't have elevator operators. We don't have gas jockeys. But now the speed of change has accelerated. That's what's really different. It took a few decades for the agricultural sector to fully absorb those innovations. When it takes place overnight, people whose skills were once very valuable are suddenly not so valuable. And they're going to have a tougher time finding the opportunities that they need to, to thrive the pace of technology-driven creative destruction is accelerating. So photo sharing sites, uh, most prominently Instagram, come along, and relatively quickly, Kodak goes from being an iconic American company to being a bankrupt American company. At its peak, Kodak employed about 140,000 people, gave them good middle-class jobs in America. When Instagram was bought at the peak of its value by Facebook, it employed 14 people. The social media king will pay $1 billion to buy Instagram. It will also hire Instagram's roughly 10 employees. Some middle-class jobs are gone for good. Global competition has changed, too. Those good jobs, relatively high-paid but low-skilled jobs, were the product of a time in American history when the U.S. didn't have to compete very hard against the rest of the world. We were industrially dominant. The world's now changed. There is a lot of competition. There's this engine of job creation in the American economy. In the post-war decades, that engine used to be cranking out good, old-fashioned, solid, middle-class American jobs that were stable, let you have a decent income, let you provide for your family, let your kid have a better future. Carl Amory is such a person. Carl's life at home reflects the security he knows at work. What's going on now is that that engine is now kicking out lower middle-class jobs in pretty large numbers. These are less stable. They are more precarious. They're not as well paid. So the days where I um, have a lifelong contract through a union uh, with a factory or a service job, um, and I know I can be here for 30 years and I'm going to retire, and, and it's all sort of laid out, uh, that is so 1950s and 1960s. But it's just not today. America is never again going to have a large, stable, prosperous middle class 
doing routine work. Modern Luddites are totally rational and totally reasonable. They're telling society, we're pissed. We are losing. You as a society, even we as a society, on average and overall, might be benefiting, but we as a subgroup are losing in this deal. What are you gonna do for us? Job disruption hurts some people more than others. One third of men in the state of Kentucky who are prime working age are not in the labor force at all. They are not employed and they're not looking for a job. So 40% of America is getting educated. Um, they have savings, they're they have stable families, they're, they're prepared for the future and they're resilient so they can take a blow, okay? And, and they can see their way to retirement. 60% of the country is not. It's not moving ahead. It's not getting educated, should. It's not building stable families. And it's in a position where it's not only not safe for retirement, but um, if it had to raise $400 for a medical or auto emergency, it would have a real problem. A lot of people don't think the economy works for them. In this period, back to 2005 and 2015, the percentage of households that saw their market, their wage-driven incomes flatten or decline is a stunning 81% in the United States. That's everybody. The New York Stock Exchange is in a panic. Everyone wants to sell. No one wants to buy. History shows that income loss creates social instability. Will that happen again? What happens in a downturn is that populist currents become more attractive. You tend to get very conflictive politics, which can take a very ugly turn. During the Great Depression, hardship led to changes in government. The 30s were a crisis of how the economic order worked. You had bread lines, you had mass unemployment, you had people who even were well-educated, had had good jobs, couldn't find work. That was the moment when it really became clear that we needed to build new types of structures, guardrails, and safety nets to ensure that capitalism functioned. Governments built programs to help families get back on their feet, from unemployment insurance to public works. When these huge, powerful new technologies come along, and they come along infrequently, steam engine, internal combustion engine, they can change an entire economy. They can interrupt the normal pace of economic progress. When that happens, we don't just let, quote, the market take care of everything. These massive technological changes require big interventions from our society and from our government. Everybody is already on the dole in that sense because we all take advantage of public goods. Infrastructure, roads, highways, public transportation, clean water, clean air, that's all government regulated and financed, and we all benefit. There are no large, successful economies in the world that do not today have a government-run safety net of some type. The Social Security Act provided retirement benefits for eligible workers. President and Mrs. Johnson and Vice President Humphrey arrive for ceremonies that will make the Medicare bill a part of Social Security coverage. But the U.S. safety net was unique. It was private as well as public. After World War II, when rivals were weak and international markets were hot for American products, employers began offering generous health and retirement benefits to attract scarce workers. That was unique to the American experience and to the American economy. Most other rich democracies didn't do it that way. Most other rich democracies didn't tie health insurance and retirement security to the job. That was a function for government, and a job was just a job, right? You went to work, you got wages. What that did, though, was to, in some ways, punish American corporations. If you're an auto company here, you're paying for health insurance and retirement security when your German or Japanese counterparts are not. Employer safety nets have been shrinking since the 1990s. This puts pressure on government to fill the gap. We are at a crisis point with our social programs. Um, they are simultaneously bankrupting the government and not helping the people who need them. The biggest problem is their unintended consequences. Many of our social programs um, stop you from working. You lose the benefit if you work. Uh, you lose the benefit if you move to a place where there are jobs. Most of our current welfare programs and social safety net programs, they're just bad. Most people don't want to be on them. They don't work well. We hate them. We should be putting all these things back on the table because the change in our technology landscape and the change in our economy is so profound. If we don't start putting programs in place to deal with the inevitable disruption, you're gonna 
have pockets of the country, if not larger swaths of the country, having to deal with significant unemployment. The growing gap between technology, the new, uh, new technology, technological progress, and the social infrastructure of the society. Because if this gap grows too big, then we know what happens. Again, read history books. In the past, new technology made it fine for new jobs to come along. People are worried that the future is going to be different this time. It's hard to know. Uh, the question is, if it is happening, what do we do about it? I think that's the next question. America's safety net was designed for full-time workers in permanent jobs. Today, many are self-employed, part-time, independent, or temporary. They don't qualify for company health plans, sick leaves, pensions, or workman's comp. They have no unemployment insurance. They work, but do not have a safety net. Some who can't find their way at all in the new economy turn to federal disability insurance. It used to be a very tiny share of Americans who were on disability less than 5%. And now, among high school dropouts, that number is well above 15%. For boys who have nothing to do. And even a good share of high school graduates, around 10%, are on disability. Once you're on Social Security disability, you're on for life. And the reason is because if you earn uh, any money, you lose your disability check. The disincentives that keep people out of work, out of finding new jobs, out of retraining, I think are the real problems of the safety net. Knitting a better safety net requires new approaches. One idea is to replace programs like disability, unemployment, and social security with a fixed cash payment for everyone. This is called universal basic income. This idea that you provide a, a, a basic income to everybody um, that gives them a floor under which they don't fall, they can buy the basic provisions of life, and from there, they can educate themselves, they can enter into the market. If they want more, they find a job. Economists like cash. Economists tend to think, well, I think people are a really good judge of what they need, so we'll give them the money and let them decide what's important to them. Critics worry that universal basic income would undermine the work ethic. The danger of universal basic income is that people just take it and don't move on in life. While I like the fact that UBI is trying to solve an income problem, which is absolutely needed, I have a problem with it simply because work is more than just income. This thing called a job has been a way to get a sense of dignity, self-respect. It's been a way to give yourself one sense of purpose, uh, a community, a social structure, something to go do. So there's this assumption that if people get free money, that the work ethic will go away. And that is just not the case. We have the evidence to suggest when it comes to lottery winners or members of the Cherokee Nation or the Alaska oil dividend recipients, people still work and in fact, in some cases work more. It's going to take a while to redesign the safety net, but there is one type of benefit every American receives that needs immediate attention, education. We were the first country in the world to set up universal, mandatory, primary education. Everybody has to go through school all the way through high school. From about 1900 to about 1970, the high school graduation rate rose from about 10% to about 70, 75%. What made America successful all of these years is that we educated our people up to and beyond whatever the technology was. So when the main technology was the cotton gin, we ensured that people had universal primary education. When the new technology was the factory, we ensured that everyone had universal secondary education. We built the world's wealthiest nation when our citizens were the best educated and the best prepared for new technology. Today, we're below average for an advanced economy. If we compare the performance of American students with that of students in other countries, we do pretty badly. We aren't absolutely the worst, uh, but we are very, very low within the developed world in terms of performance. Globalization is putting all these other educated people, pumping them into the world, and they're moving past us. School outcomes also vary widely across the United States. Hispanic students in Texas are at the top of the nation. The Hispanic students in California are at the bottom of the nation. Harmony Public Schools show what's happening in some Texas schools. 
Harmony sets high standards for both students and teachers. Specialized instruction in science and math begins in third grade. Robotics are emphasized in all grades. College planning begins in eighth grade and college acceptance is required for graduation. The most important ingredient, good teachers. The value added by a really good teacher, a teacher who's in, say, the top 20% of teachers in the United States, is about a quarter of a million dollars over someone's lifetime. And you have to remember that she teaches probably 20 to 25 students a year. On average, we have very good teachers, but we allow ineffective teachers to stay in the classroom. Almost a complete impossibility of trying to keep the attention of 35 different people who will, you know, be thinking about what they had for breakfast, what they didn't have for lunch, why their boyfriend didn't write them a letter, whatever else it may be. If you get two or three bad teachers in a row, the student is in trouble forever, for lifetime. What we need to do is totally change the way teachers are paid so that we are paying people a lot if they are high, highly productive teachers and we are not offering that same level of pay to teachers who are not very good at teaching. What greater return on an investment can you possibly get than your kids? If we agree that education is about preparing our kids for the future, what are we doing? We should be good and panicked. But the panic does not fundamentally come from technology. We are not preparing the children that we have today for the workforce they will be in tomorrow. I think our current educational system is doing a really good job of turning out the kinds of workers we needed 70 years ago. We need to better prepare our children. But what about adults for whom the future is now? How can we help older workers? You are angry. Not angry, just frustrated. How did you know that? I recognize emotions from facial expressions. Sadness. <laughs> Happiness. Yo, 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 yo. <laughs> Students who are sleeping. That's funny, but if you can't help me grade, how can you really help me? I can teach you how to code. You can create an artificial intelligence program to help you improve your teaching. Learn to code at my age? Anyone can learn to code. We all have to keep learning. In the past, you could go to school or college or vocational school, study a particular task and master it, and stop and just spend the rest of your life applying it. I think that, that paradigm is gone. Now, things you learn in your first year of college will be outdated by your fourth year. In 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, you trained in something, and that job was pretty much going to be available. What happens when those skills don't become useful anymore? What are you going to do? That means everyone has to find their extra, okay? Their unique um, value add. And I have to think everyone's good at something. Everyone's above average at something. I, I really do believe that. Some people are, are really good at taking care of the elderly. Some people are really fantastic entertainers. Some people are really good social connectors. What about the 70% of Americans without college degrees? The state of Colorado has partnered with Markle Foundation and private companies like LinkedIn to take a new approach with displaced workers. Career counselors in the Skillful State Network help people see the connection between their current abilities and emerging industries. They help workers identify new skills they need. The program coaches companies to look beyond formal qualifications and recruit for expertise. 19 states have recently joined Skillful. If you're a job seeker, you should have access to a well-trained professional that knows the economy, knows training pipelines, knows industries that are growing, and can give you strategic information so that you can be successful. My job is to help people understand that the pathway that they may have seen their parents or their friends in their community do aren't the only pathways for them. Automation means all of us need to embrace continuous retraining. Employers realize that they need to start investing in their workforce so that they don't have to look at dislocation because of a technology shift. Well, the social contract that companies like AT&T are making with their employees is very simple, which is we will actually provide you the, the access to post-secondary education. There's just one condition. You have to take these courses at home at night and on weekends. I think the most important skill in the future will be ability to keep on learning. In the technology world, in my world, we're used to new technologies being invented every five years, and then all of us have to change our work. What I tell my son is, if anything, 
learn how to learn. Uh, so whatever you go study, learn to learn, because you're probably going to need to acquire so many skills over your entire working life, and that's going to happen so rapidly. The biggest divide in the world is going to be the self-motivation divide. Who has the self-motivation to be a lifelong learner long after you've left home and mom and dad aren't there to say, Tommy, have you done your homework? I love to learn. There, there's always something new. Whenever The more you learn, the more opportunity that's created. Are you new here too? Now I've been here three days. Some of those opportunities spring from things humans will always do better than machines. Ask questions, provide inspiration, give love. There are a lot of things that machines can do much better than we can. But there are so many more things that we can do much better than machines can. And these things primarily uh, involve creative reasoning, abstraction, um, strategic thinking. So the skills that are needed in the future are the ability to persuade people, the ability to form emotional connections, to express sympathy. Those are the skills that will wind up being valuable in the workplace place of the future, as opposed to your ability to swing a hammer quickly and accurately. There's another set of skills that are even more valuable and growing in value even more quickly than STEM skills, and those are high-level interpersonal skills. And I'm talking about things like motivation, coordination, these interpersonal things. Wow, we're not going to have a girl soccer coach robot anytime soon. For centuries, we worked with our hands, you know, on 90% of us. And then in the last 100 years, or particularly since the Industrial Revolution, a lot of us started to work with our heads. As we go forward, more and more of us are gonna work with our hearts. The future holds promise, but only if we rise to its challenges. Fearing change, it turns out, doesn't slow change down. It only makes it more painful to go through. And we, as a society, need to recognize technology is going to continue to speed up, and we need to get better at turning over our social norms and the way we teach our children and hundreds of other things so that we can keep up with the pace of change of the world. That's the difference between drowning in the water and riding the wave. How can America ride the wave? How can we make sure our economy improves everyone's standard of living as in the past? Technology itself is not a threat to prosperity. The threat is in neglecting to learn and neglecting our institutions. History shows that access, transparency, and rule of law spurred inventiveness. Safety nets helped workers over rough spots. Education got them ready for new technology. If we want to be peaceful and prosperous, we must safeguard these traditions and take on the future. my first program. I can use the data from the test to rank my own lectures from best to worst. This way I know which ones are effective and which ones need more work. That is helpful. You are a good learner. All right, okay, time for class. Robots and artificial intelligence are our next set of tools, but they'll never replace us. Robots only have answers. We have the questions. Hey, do you have a name? My name is Pepper. <laughs> well, Pepper, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. 